London, throughout the ages, has had a reputation for being a city of blood, guts and gore. Heads on spikes once adorned London Bridge of those that had betrayed the city and its residents. People were hanged from gallows as a public deterrent for crimes as simple as stealing a loaf of bread, and decaying bodies contained within gibbets were strung up along the river to serve as a gory reminder for anyone that may be thinking of committing a crime in the city that if caught, they would be cruelly punished. Today on Macabre London, we uncover the gruesome tales of crime and punishment in the capital city. Welcome back to another episode of Macabre London. I'm Nikki Druce, your host with the silent G, and today I'll be taking you on a journey down another of London's grimy back streets to uncover a macabre tale from the city's past. However, before we get into today's episode, if you're new here and you want to see more videos where we deep dive into some lesser known historic tales from London's past, then please don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a new episode. And if you like the show and want it to continue, please consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is in the show notes. Also, I have a new show which is out now with Cheryl Hole from Drag Race called Killers, Cults and Queens. So if you want more of me and also the Queen of Essex, please check it out now. The link is in the description. And thanks so much for listening if you have already. We were absolutely over the moon that with your help, we managed to make it all the way to number one in the true crime category on the podcast charts, not only on Spotify, but also on Apple, which is absolutely huge. So thank you very much for making that happen. London has always had a reputation for treating those that wronged it with the harshest of punishments. Before the establishment of the police and proper lawmakers, the capital city operated under its own rules and was ruthless to anyone that created a problem for it. Even as early as the Roman settlement in 43 AD, people were subject to capital punishment. The Romans only had a short list of crimes that you could be executed for, such as forgery, theft or murder, but their list of execution methods was much longer. Criminals were subjected to a variety of painful, lengthy and brutal methods of death, which would have been an effective deterrent for anyone thinking of committing a crime. Being thrown from height, immolated, drowned or even buried alive were just a few of the inventive ways they found to off their bad guys. Perhaps the most inventive execution method was crucifixion. Whilst there is no evidence that this happened in London, a skeleton was found in the small village of Fenstanton in Cambridgeshire, which had a nail through its ankle, leading experts to believe they'd discovered what may have been one of the many people executed across the country in this manner. As society progressed and the population started to grow, things started to change. By the 10th century, all other methods of execution had been outlawed, and hanging was declared the most humane method, but by the time of the Tudors and the rise of Henry VIII in the 16th century, things had become quite inventive, and many methods of being put to death had been either devised or brought out of retirement. Public beheadings were considered the quickest way to dispose of an enemy, but this was reserved for those of a higher class. Hanging was still fairly primitive, and as the long drop method was yet to be invented, coming much later in the mid-1800s, beheading was opted for those of the gentry as it appeared to be far more humane. However, that's only if it was done correctly. Henry VIII was the bloodiest of all the royals, During his 36-year reign, it's estimated that around 72,000 people died on his orders, mainly as a result of disobedience and reluctance to entirely devote themselves to him. Henry was incredibly classist and believed that the commoners and peasants were worthy of torture, but not those in the upper echelons of society. 
Back when the Tower of London was first built by William the Conqueror in 1066 to demonstrate the power of the Normans, it was originally intended to be London's great fortress, and 956 years later, it's still standing strong with its original intention intact. The Norman conquest provided London with a great palace of fortitude, but over the years the grounds of the tower have expanded to cater for a number of interests in the city. The tower did indeed hold many criminals within its prison walls, but incarceration was only a small part of the original intention behind its inception. It also acted as a city within a city, and even to this day, if the drawbridge was raised and the hatches battened down, life could continue within its walls without much outside influence quite easily. The tower was a place where the Royal Mint operated, creating and controlling the city's money. It was a place for entertainment, with a whole zoo being housed within it, including a polar bear which was allowed to swim in the Thames, and entrance to visitors once being free if they bought a cat or dog to feed to the lions. Families have lived in the boundary walls for hundreds of years, and high-profile prisoners such as the young Princess Elizabeth in the mid-1500s, who had a whole floor of the building to herself, where she would live still tended to by servants, and allowed out of the tower with supervision. Up until the Tudor era, the imprisonment and punishment part of the tower was only a small element of what the vast area was used for. However, once Henry VIII was in power, this was when the river, which lapped at its walls, would run red with the blood of his enemies. Henry Tudor was a highly intelligent young boy, and given that it was assumed he would never succeed to the throne, given he had an older brother, Arthur, he was pushed into the path of religion and became an official defender of the faith. Henry loved hunting and was very athletic. He was also creative and wrote books, poetry and composed music. One of his tunes, Pastime with Good Company, was incredibly popular and he wrote a lot of music which the Tudors enjoyed. He didn't write green sleeves though, so can we stop telling people that please? Thank you. When he wasn't absorbed in his creative endeavours, Henry was either hunting or at mass. He would allegedly get through a number of horses in a day, hunting in Greenwich Park. Once his older brother passed away, after a bout of sweating sickness, leaving Henry as heir to the throne, the 17-year-old was next in line. Henry's father, Henry VII, passed away from tuberculosis, and 17-year-old Henry took his place. Henry didn't only take his brother's place on the throne, but he also took his wife. Henry was married to Catherine of Aragon ahead of his coronation, and fast forward 24 years, and the first ever divorce was carried out, and Catherine was usurped by Anne Boleyn, the sister of one of Henry's mistresses, Mary, who was also lady-in-waiting to the now-deposed Catherine. Anne and Henry had been married for just a few years, and things had been rocky from the get-go. Anne was an independent woman, and didn't necessarily care for the dedication Henry constantly required from her. She'd also failed to give Henry a son, and as such, tensions were running high in their marriage, but things were about to change for the worse. In late January 1536, Henry was jousting in Greenwich when he suffered a bad fall from his horse. He fell in front of his steed whilst dressed in full armour, and the weight of the animal crushed him, along with the metal and chainmail he was encased in. Pregnant Anne, who was back at the palace, got word that Henry may not survive, and the stress of the news caused her to suffer a miscarriage of what would turn out to be a son. Henry suffered a head injury as part of his accident, and was knocked out cold for two hours, and it took him months to recover, never fully regaining his full health, and leaving him far less active than he was before. After his fall, Henry was never the same. He was frustrated, stressed, and his personality changed. What he once saw as minor annoyances from Anne were now turning into major issues, and he began to resent her, dreaming of how he could get rid of her. He accused his wife of adultery, treason, and incest with her brother, even though none of these claims were substantiated, and he planned in detail her execution, even shipping in an expert swordsman from France to do the deed. 
Anne faced her fate stoically and even joked with the swordsman to be careful as she only had a small neck. She even praised Henry before her execution, saying he was a kind and gentle king. She was gracious and appeared unfazed right up until the last. In fact, the secretary to the French ambassador, Lancelot de Carle, was in the crowd that day and he wrote the following account after her beheading. She gracefully addressed the people from the scaffold with a voice somewhat overcome by weakness, but which gathered strength as she went on. She begged her hearers to forgive her if she had not used them all with the becoming gentleness and asked for their prayers. It was needless, she said, to relate why she was there, but she prayed the judge of all the world to have compassion on those who had condemned her, and she begged them to pray for the king, in whom she had always found great kindness, fear of God, and love of his subjects. The spectators could not refrain from tears. Anne gracefully didn't admit to anything she was accused of, and it said she was generous to her husband despite his obvious mistreatment of her, as she feared repercussions for her family, as he had now become a vicious, bloodthirsty man. Anne was executed in the Tower of London, outside of the White Tower, and buried in the chapel within the grounds. After Anne's execution, Henry became more and more deadly. Before Anne's death, he had sent 200 rebels from an uprising of 50,000 to the gallows after they refused to accept him as the head of the church. But from now on, anyone who even as much hinted at opposition to his kingdom would pay the ultimate price with their lives. Henry now used the tower as his own private torture house and prison, and since his accident, he'd become frustrated with his inability to let out his aggressions whilst jousting, becoming corpulent and spiteful, acting out his frustrations on his loyal, or in his view, not-so-loyal subjects, quickly becoming England's most prolific serial killer, even though he never did the deed himself. As the nature of the tower turned from fortress to torture chamber and prison, those who had wronged the king started to pile up. When one of these prisoners was accused of stealing the king's gold, they must have known it was only going to be a short while before they were in for a rough old time. In 1531, the London docks received a very important import, 366 gold French crowns. The shipment, which was handled by only the most trustworthy of guards, was brought into the city on board a boat where it was guarded 24-7 and bolted to the floor of the ship inside an iron chest in case of pirates. However, when the chest reached its final destination, it was opened and much to the dismay of the king's accountants, it was completely empty. But how did a chest that was bolted to the floor and guarded the whole time lose its contents. The mystery completely perplexed the sailors, and if anyone did know anything, they were definitely not going to say so, as if there was even the slightest inkling they had anything to do with the plot, they would be in trouble with the king or the thieves, both of which would have ended in death. After two years, no one knew what had happened to the crowns, which were estimated to have been worth around a million in today's money, had seemingly vanished without a trace, never to be seen again. However, inside the tower, there may just have been one man who knew exactly what had happened to the stolen treasure. John Wolfe, a sailor turned thief, was being held in the tower for a number of petty thefts, but rumour started to spread that he may have just been the one responsible for the theft of the king's gold. However, the evidence to substantiate this claim was severely lacking. As there wasn't much to pin John on, he was kept in relative comfort. He was allowed food, ale and the home comforts you wouldn't have usually expected from such a place. The longer John was in the tower, the friendlier he got with the guards that worked there and soon they were allowing him more and more home comforts. His girlfriend, Alice Tankerville, was allowed to visit her boyfriend in prison and she too became friendly with the men who were guarding her beloved. She ingratiated herself with the guards and over time was allowed to spend more time with John, 
and to bring him luxury items such as nicer food and alcohol. Little did they realise that Alice should have also been behind bars as she too had a hand in stealing the king's gold. Alice and John were both very good thieves. The criminal pair had been grifting John's place of work, the dockyards, for many years up until he was suspected of stealing from the king. They'd both been working on extorting merchants who would never tell the authorities if they were scammed, as stupidity in the realm of finance and trading was not something you would want those that trust you with their money to know about, and it would be very bad for business. So ultimately, it was the perfect crime. When the pair heard about the impending shipment of the French crowns, they came up with a genius plan which would land them the fortune. Alice was to woo the two merchants put in charge of offloading the king's money from the ship and make them an offer to go with her for an evening of fun and frolics. Alice was said to be incredibly beautiful and the two men fell for this invitation, hook, line and sinker. Alice made them board a small rowboat on the Thames so she could take them somewhere more private and off they all went, rowing towards what they thought would be an enjoyable evening. But unfortunately they were unaware they were about to be embroiled in a heist. As a friend of Alice's rode them to their destination, the trio disembarked from their transport into the undergrowth, but a good time was not to meet them. Instead, John was hidden in the bushes, wanting to ambush the pair. He stabbed both men with a sword and waited for them to breathe their last breaths. With the two men dead and the key secured for the trunk and the room it was stored in, they tied up their victims and loaded them back onto the boat and began to row back to shore. When they reached the middle of the Thames, they weighted the bodies with stones and pushed the two dead merchants into the water and watched them sink. Once back on land, Alice, John and their unnamed accomplice went and stole the crowns and made off with their treasure. As time went by, the thieves behind the heist were completely unknown. But when the bodies of the merchants were discovered six months after their deaths, some circumstantial evidence pointed to John, and so even with no proof, he was arrested for something pettier, but with the thought being he may also be responsible for the heist. Six months passed with John incarcerated in the tower, but during this time no evidence was produced, and he'd served his time for the petty crime he was originally charged with, and as he had been a model prisoner and incredibly well behaved, he was set free. Understandably, John didn't waste any time in sorting out an escape from the country, and as soon as he could, he jumped on a boat and fled to Ireland. Luckily, John left right in time, as only a few weeks after he'd departed London, new evidence was uncovered which would implicate not only him, but also Alice in the theft. A year passed and Alice had gone to ground. In fact, she was protected by one of John's guards from the prison, John Board, and during her boyfriend's absence, Alice took a shine to him and not knowing if or when John Wolfe would return, she began a relationship with him. About a year later, John returned to London from his stay in Ireland, thinking the heat was off, but it wasn't, and he was arrested and thrown back into the tower. During his time in Ireland, it's believed that John was busy selling the crowns and turning them into standard cash, which wasn't so recognisable, so he could bring back a fortune to Alice. However, he didn't realise he would be rumbled so quickly after arriving back in London. Not long after John had been thrown in the tower, Alice was tracked down and imprisoned in the cold harbour tower. Perhaps John was disgruntled with his girlfriend's affair with John Board and ratted her out. Or maybe authorities tricked her into meeting the now imprisoned John. Either way, both of them were now in serious trouble. Alice was chained within her cell and put in manacles which were attached to the wall, an excruciating form of torture where the prisoner was suspended off the floor with their wrists secured with iron cuffs. With both Alice and John now in the tower, the court went ahead and tried Alice without her being present. She was delivered the news in her cell that the court had decided she was guilty and that she had been sentenced to death. With a mixture of anger, fear and determination and plenty of time to concoct a plan whilst in chains, 
she devised an escape route. John Board, who Alice had fallen for whilst John Wolfe was away, just so happened to be assigned as her prison guard, unbeknownst to those in charge, as otherwise there was no way he would have been allowed to look after her. Alice had managed to convince Board that he should break her out of prison and literally save her life. Perhaps Alice convinced Board that she could obtain the stolen money from Wolf from the sale of the crowns from his stash, and once she was free, they could elope. With his insider knowledge of the tower, Board carefully devised a way to break Alice out. On the night of March 23rd, 1534, Board walked past Alice's cell and dropped a key on the floor, which he then pushed through a tiny gap between the door and the floor. A few hours earlier, Board had gone into the cell and given Alice a length of rope, which she stashed in a dark corner of the room to avoid detection by any other passing guards who may pop in to see her. Board also undid her manacles, but she remained in them, ready to break free when the moment came. When she heard the key drop on the floor, Alice knew it was time to spring into action. She released herself from her restraints and made her way to the door of her cell. The inner door had been loosely fastened and broke open with a shove. She could then grab the key from the floor and unlock the outer door, letting herself out from the inside. As random key inspections and also the sharing of keys was commonplace in the tower, Board knew he had to be prepared for this, and so the key he gave to Alice was a hand-carved replica he'd whittled himself and then checked earlier in the evening when he delivered the rope. Along with the stashed rope, Board also left a black cape for Alice so she could cover her face with the hood and use the dark garment to her advantage to escape in the dead of night. Board ended his shift as usual that evening in the tower, and instead of going home, he waited nearby until things became quiet inside. Once they did, he snuck back in and went to the top of St Thomas's Tower. By this time, Alice had already had quite the adventure. She'd snuck out of her cell and clambered her way from Cold Harbour in the centre of the compound, across the buildings, and then up to her and Board's pre-agreed meeting spot, St Thomas's Tower. Once the pair were reunited on top of the tower, they wasted no time escaping. St Thomas's Tower is on the Thames-facing side of the tower wall, and the pair abseiled down and dropped into a getaway boat that Board had left there for the pair to make a quick escape upon. Board sailed him and his criminal mistress away along the Thames, and the pair must have breathed a sigh of relief, watching the imposing fortress disappearing from view as they rowed away. However, they had no time to rest on their laurels, and now time was of the essence. Board knew that as soon as the guards in the tower realised Alice was gone, that all hell would break loose, and there would be guards out in force trying to track them down, so the sooner they got out of London, the better. Board had cleverly stashed two horses for them to ride out of the city, and had paid a lady to keep them in her stables until they arrived. As the pair disembarked the boat, they started to make their way away from the river. As they did so, they were horrified to see a small group of night watchmen headed in their direction. Alice and Board couldn't go anywhere to escape them apart from turn around, and that would look decidedly suspicious, so they pressed on forward in the hopes they wouldn't be stopped. John gave a cursory good evening to the men and the hooded Alice bowed her head and they continued on. They breathed a sigh of relief as they walked on, but unfortunately they'd not been so lucky. One of the night watchmen recognised Board and they caught up to him and Alice, he tried to strike up a conversation, and panicking, Alice tried to run. The men suddenly realised that something wasn't quite right, and it was then they realised who the mysterious hooded figure was. In a panic, they tried to run, but the men overpowered them and took them both straight back to the tower. Alice was thrown straight back into her prison cell and subsequently placed back in her manacles. Board, however, would suffer a much worse fate. Inside the Tower of London was a cell that was reserved for the most heinous of crimes, and as John had betrayed not only his fellow guards in releasing Alice, he'd also betrayed the Crown. 
As such, he was shown to the cell known as Little E's. This tiny hole in the wall was designed to deliver the utmost in discomfort to its occupant. The small cube was only big enough for a person to crouch in. The ceiling was too low for anyone to stand up or stretch out, and there were no windows leaving bored in pitch black agony. Over the next few days, prison officials decided that they couldn't risk Alice escaping again, and so just eight days after the escape attempt, she was set to be executed. However, she wouldn't go it alone. John Wolfe would also join her. As the crime of theft from a ship and the murder of the two merchants was seen as piracy, John and Alice were spared the anguish of hanging. However, their method of execution would be much, much worse. As they lived as pirates, they would die like pirates, and so they were put in manacles and suspended in the Thames. As the tide rose, they fought for their lives, but they were never going to win. The water slowly engulfed them, and they both drowned. As a reminder to those that passed them on the river, they remained in their chains until three tides had risen and fallen. Board was not treated to such a short period between his capture and subsequent execution. Once he'd been allowed out of little ease, he was sent to the torture chamber where he was put upon the rack. The rack was an awful, agonising punishment. The victim was attached by the wrists and ankles to coiled ropes operated by a wheel, which when turned pulled their body in opposite directions. The arms would be pulled upward and the legs downward. This was done slowly as to not tear the person apart. Board was given several sessions on the rack before he was eventually executed, but any wish he had for this to be done quickly was not granted. To make sure he was also used as an example to those outside the tower, he was also suspended in manacles. However, he didn't have the benefit of the tide to hasten his death. Instead, he was left for days in the cold and rain, without food or water, and left to die. His body was left for several days on the wall, and as the crows pecked at it, the passers-by was served a valuable lesson that the tower and the crown were so vicious that this was how they treated even those that once served them and were their friends, so the general criminal public had better behave. The death of Alice Tankerville and her accomplices was a horrific end for all involved, but their gruesome deaths aren't the only thing they're remembered for. Alice was the first and only woman to escape from the Tower of London, even though it was only for about an hour or so. And the torture in the Tower doesn't end with the two Johns and Alice. For our next tale of terror, we have to head outside the Tower walls. But I think I might just save that one for next time. joining me for this episode as always i'd love to know your thoughts on this one so please leave me a comment and a thumbs up on youtube or a rating on your podcast provider if you're new around here and you've not yet subscribed i'd love for you to join the ghoul gang we're a friendly bunch so do come and join us also if you enjoy the show and you'd like to support what i make then why not consider becoming a patron like these amazing legendary executive patreon producers amy bex christina jess kate kevin Mary, Sam, Sarah and Veronica, and all of our other patrons too. As we're now in spooky season and gearing up to Halloween, if you join Patreon before the start of October and select the $10 tier, you'll receive a little trick or treat pack through the post from me, along with some other goodies as well. And you'll also get access to all the exclusive Halloween content I'll be making on there, which in my opinion is a fantastic deal. So get yourself over there now. If you're not up for a long-term commitment and you'd just like to leave a tip, then there's my Amazon wishlist, which has items to help me make the show, and then there's also the one-off donation links in the description too, or you can use the ACAR supporter link at the beginning of the podcast. All support is absolutely vital for me being able to continue making the show, and thanks from the bottom of my heart for even considering supporting me. You're the absolute best. Thanks for joining me for another macabre tale from London's past. 
I've been Nikki Drews, and I'll see you ghouls next time. Thank you.